Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, what is this? And how haven't I seen it? Okay, uh, so is this Al Murray World War II? Original link to the video, top of the description, below that link to the Discord. We'd love to have you. Let's go, guys. This is a landing craft, very like the ones that we used on D-Day. On June the 6th, 1944, thousands of Allied troops poured out of boats like this onto the Normandy beaches. It was the biggest seaborne invasion of all time. And it would be the start of the greatest military campaign in history, a thousand mile march to the heart of Hitler's Reich. The story of the invasion begins in southern England, Sorry. where the secret planning for the whole extraordinary operation took place. Operation Overlord, the Allied code name for the invasion of Europe, was a hugely complex affair. 150,000 troops, 5,000 ships, thousands of sorties flown by fighters and bombers. Right, I'm just still kind of giddy from the fact that there's a documentary about World War II that Al Murray's hosting. Ah, ah, go. All right. The Allied code name for the story uh, of the just, invasion. Just, I'm restarting. Just, just keep. The story of the invasion begins in southern England, where the secret planning for the whole extraordinary operation took place. Operation Overlord, the Allied code name for the invasion of Europe, was a hugely complex affair. 150,000 troops, 5,000 ships, thousands of sorties flown by fighters and bombers in support. Not the sort of thing you could jot down on a single piece of paper. But General Bernard Law Montgomery, Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Land Forces managed to do exactly that. Monty had a reputation for being difficult and was not the Americans' first choice for the job of organising the invasion. But on the 2nd of January 1944, he was brought back from the fighting in Italy to plan D-Day. This is a facsimile of the one-page note that Montgomery drew up for himself when he was given the job of planning the invasion. It's most secret. Uh, it's all on here. Heavy air bombing from as soon as light permits until after HR. That's when the invasion starts. The forward body, the main body. But at the bottom, he's written something very telling. The keynote of everything to be simplicity, underlined three times. This shows the confidence of the man. D-Day, as complex as it is, is pretty much all on this one page. In the months leading up to D-Day, a massive armada started to assemble all around the British coastline, with its heart at Portsmouth. As the troops built up, you could hardly move for Allied soldiers, ammo dumps and vehicle depots. The man in charge of this massive invasion was the American General Ike Eisenhower. Monty was in charge of all the land forces. Their headquarters were based here at Southwark House, just a few miles from Portsmouth. This is Shafe, Supreme Headquarters Guys, Allied Expedition. Question. So, qu question, question. So, if let's say that the uh, Battle of Britain was lost and Germany invaded Britain before America got involved in the war, would there then? A, a lot of the times whenever I ask these questions, I, I always hear, you know, well, no matter what, the, they, they had to, to defeat the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was not giving up. But I, I wonder if they were able to do that, uh, take Britain out of the war, and then even if the United States on its own wanted to invade Europe, which it, it probably couldn't do without the Canadians and British anyway, um, they, they, did, they wouldn't have that giant aircraft carrier that is the British Isles to coordinate that invasion. You can't plan an invasion over the entire Atlantic Ocean. So I'm wondering anyone I, I've yet to ask any of these questions and be like, yeah, well uh, uh, Hitler in Germany would still have lost because you know they didn't have the oil here. They had to you know, the, the, the Soviet Union, they overstretched and and but I, I wonder if if the Battle of Britain was lost and Britain was conquered, do you believe that the, that 
maybe they, they would have had to um, defeat Japan first and then coordinate with the Soviets who hopefully would still be standing to go in in, in Easter. Like, so what, what would happen? Um, I'm just wondering if you think Germany still would have lost if Britain was lost. I, I took way too long to ask that. Were based here and forces. Mm -hmm. Their headquarters were based here at Southwark House, just a few miles from Portsmouth. This is Schaefe, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, Ike Eisenhower's headquarters for plotting the D-Day landings. And this room here is the room from which they coordinated those landings. Now, it's just an officer's mess now. It's all comfy sofas and the like. But on the wall there is the actual map they used for running the D-Day invasion. This map is for Operation Neptune, the naval portion of the invasion. It shows the ships coming down from southern Britain, meeting up in what was called the invasion. It shows the ships coming down from southern Britain, meeting up in what was called Piccadilly Circus in the middle of the channel, then going down in five streams to the five Normandy landing beaches. Yeah, didn't they have sort of these lighthouse boats that would essentially just kind of go out into the channel and then float however long apart just as like a, you know, so that the forces could see where they're going. Hitler had known there would be an invasion for at least a year, but he didn't know where it would come, and the Allies didn't want him to think of Normandy. So they instituted LA. a huge deception plan called Operation Fortitude to keep him guessing. And what they wanted to persuade him was that the invasion would come in the most obvious place. LA. At the Pas de Calais, between Dover and Calais, where the channel is the narrowest. And the Germans fell for it, concentrating their strongest divisions just where the Allies wanted them. At quarter past four on the morning of June the 5th, D-Day minus one, a window in the weather allowed Eisenhower to make the decision to launch the invasion. D-Day would be June the 6th, 1944. But the weather was still by no means perfect, and across the channel, one of Germany's most able generals... By the way, uh, my grandfather's, uh, my great... I've been to Normandy twice, the graveyard, uh, once in 2006 and another time 2014. Uh, I, I don't know, but the, the, I have one of those. Or I have. When you go there, they you can find out your relative who, who died on, on, uh, on the invasion, right? I, he was my great, great uncle. I think my dad's uncle. So my grandfather's brother. Um, but they're super awesome there, and like they have someone there to take you out over there, and uh, apparently, from like I, I guess where they grabbed the dog tag, they could sort of tell where they died, relatively, like at what stage, and, and apparently, um. He died, uh, like, right a on the beachhead on uh, Omaha Beach. Generals was about was still by no means perfect, and across the channel, one of Germany's most able generals was about to do the Allies an unexpected favor. Rommel, the legendary Desert Fox, was in charge of the German defenses, the so-called Atlantic Wall. But the day before D-Day, he was so convinced by the bad weather that an invasion wouldn't happen that he went home to Germany to celebrate his wife's 50th birthday. As the Allied landings began, he was at home, cutting cake with the missus. With Rommel hundreds of miles away in Germany, thousands of Allied ships from as far apart as Wales and East Anglia were already setting sail for the English Channel. At the same time, Allied bombers were flying countless missions to drop thousands of tons of bombs on the German defences. And the men who would try to seize the first of the vital British targets that night prepared for their mission. At 22.56 hours, D-Day minus one, gliders carrying men from the Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry took off from southern England. Their mission was to seize by stealth and surprise the bridge over the Conn Canal in the tiny village of Benouville. That bridge is now better known as Pegasus Bridge. 
This bridge over the Caen Canal and a second one over the nearby river Dive would be the obvious place for any German armoured counterattack once the landings had started. Midnight on D-Day. The British troops who had trained for months for this one mission were approaching the target in their gliders. One of the men in the first glider that night was 22-year-old Wally Parr. This is the first time Wally's set foot in a horse glider since the war. Oh, blimey, I know I thought, well. Yeah. Oh, okay, oh bloody. Wally's set foot in a horse glider since the war. Oh, blimey, I know I thought, well. Yeah. Oh, okay, oh, bloody hell. Oh, the spring break, a few memories. Not bad. When you're being towed, you can hear the roar of the plane mm. in front. Oh, right, it's a glider. But then, when you're cast off, it's just a yeah. And of course, they opened the front door as they were coming in. <laughs> well, I'll open that back door. And I went over and I thought, what are about? I said, Charlie, grab all of my equipment and hold me tight. And sure enough, I opened that back door and the bloody wind came belting through there. Yeah, yeah, you could have been blown out. I could have been blown straight out of that bloody back door. Oh, God. As they glided silently towards the bridge, it was almost pitch black. I, I was about to ask a question that I think is about to be answered right here. So, never mind. As they glided silently towards the bridge, it was almost pitch black. Manning the defences by the canal was a company of German infantry, well dug into their bunkers and machine gun pillboxes. The bridge itself was packed with explosives. The British expected the Germans to blow the bridge the moment the invasion began. Seizing Pegasus Bridge seemed like a suicide mission. The key to capturing the bridge was to get as close as possible. To do this, the British used a technique they'd pinched from the Germans, the coup de main attack, a smash and grab surprise raid in which gliders full of soldiers would literally land on top of a target, overwhelming its defenders before they even knew what was going on. And so, at 16 minutes past midnight on D-Day, glider number one containing men from the 2nd Battalion, the Oxenbucks Light Infantry, landed right here literally a stone's throw from the bridge. The first glider threw up friction sparks in the pitch darkness, skidding to a halt just 45 metres from the bridge. The accuracy was staggering. Within three minutes, the second and third gliders landed just behind. Hey, uh, guys, so... So, the question I was going to ask, so, so they, they get released from the plane on the glider, and then the glider is just, there's no propulsion, right? It's, it's a glider. But they they can steer it in a way, and then then they try to land it like a. I, I was expecting them to um. I was expecting it to just be like a sort of more stealthy paratroop drop, you know, like you you release the glider releases from the back of the plane, and then it goes in, and then w when you get as far as you can, you jump out. But no, they're ac they're actually intended to land it. But land it... how? Uh... ...was staggering. Within three minutes, the second and third gliders landed just behind. Were you knocked out by the impact? No, we were just stunned. Yeah. We were sort of stunned, and there was dust everywhere. And then somebody blasphemed, and somebody moaned, and then somebody shouted, Ow! So how long did it take you to get onto the bridge then, from the landing? Oh, from the land, and it took us something in the region of about three or four minutes. Right, right. It went as fast as that. I mean, you see all this um, jumping over barbed wire. Yeah. Uh, we literally ploughed through the damn stuff, stamped on it, and rushed onto the bridge. The men of the Ox and Bucks stormed the bridge, killing or driving off the German guards. Wally Parr and his mate Charlie Gardner took out three German bunkers with grenades and a Sten gun. Minutes later, the bridge was secure as the Germans had been unable to detonate the explosives. And the second bridge had also been taken without a single shot being fired. Wow. So the entire point of this mission is it so, so, seems so much more specialized. specialized. I, I don't know how I didn't... Was to send the gliders in, make as little noise as possible, and get in to 
you know, uh, just by surprise disarm them before they can detonate it, and that's why they called it a suicide type mission. Okay, sorry, just. The signals for capturing those two bridges yep. was ham for the bridge over the Khan Canal yep. and jam for the run, one over the River Dees. Yep. And um, if we captured both of them, which wasn't expected, the signal was to be ham and jam. At 26 minutes past midnight, the signal ham and jam was sent back to Brigade HQ to confirm that the first land operation of D-Day had been a success and with only very light casualties. Any German counterattack would now be held up and the Allied mission to take Caen was one step closer. Would they need some sort of specialist approach to, to get rid of the explosives or did they keep the explosives on in, in case it like it was all going perfectly, just like the plans, like all the rehearsals back in England, just like clockwork. But a few miles up the road in that direction, things weren't going quite so smoothly. At one o'clock in the morning, the British were about to launch their second airborne mission of D-Day on the German gun battery at Mareville. Sword Beach lay just a couple of miles away, well within reach of the... Yeah, uh, Omaha is where my... Uh great uncle died their second airborne mission of d-day on the german gun battery at mareville sword beach lay just a couple of miles away well within reach or of the great, german great uncle. millimeter guns here if the british landings on sword were to be successful the mareville battery had to be taken out the plan which had been rehearsed many many times in uh, England, i didn't freaking i was better sword beach lay just a couple of miles away well within reach of the german 100 millimeter guns here if the British landings on Sword were to be successful, the Merville battery had to be taken out. The plan, which had been rehearsed many, many times in England, was for the 9th Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, numbering about 600 men, to parachute in over there, about a mile away. They'd then form up at a rendezvous and proceed to attack the battery. At the same time, other men from the battalion, in three gliders, were to swoop in and land in a coup de main-style attack and seize the battery by surprise. So much for plans. The drop was chaotic. Many of the gliders and paratroopers landed miles away or didn't make it at all, and almost all the heavy equipment was lost. It could have been even worse. At half past one, news of the British airborne landings reached the local German tank commander. But without Hitler's personal permission, the panzers were unable to move. The Fuhrer was fast asleep and no one dared wake him. It was a huge stroke of luck for the 29 year old Colonel Otway and his small. What do you mean? What, this is what, what do you mean? No one dared wake him. I feel like this is the one. I, I get it that there is a, a thing about you know a fear of him, and I, I, I'm I'm not that ignorant here. Okay, I, I I know that, but it's the it's the invasion of France. You'd think if there's one thing he won't mind you waking him up for, it's that. A group of paratroopers about to attack luck for the 29 year old Colonel Otway and his small group of paratroopers about to attack the Mareville battery. With the drop so badly scattered by half past two in the morning Lieutenant Colonel Otway the commanding officer of Nine Para reviewed his forces. Only 150 men had made the rendezvous over there some quarter of the battalion's strength. Not only that, the RAF's bombardment of the battery had gone awry. They'd set fire to the village of Gonville over there, but the battery's defences of a minefield of barbed wire remained untouched. Not only that, the engineers whose job it was to clear those defences were nowhere to be found. With his plan in tatters, Otway was going to have to improvise with what he'd got. I burped, sorry. Colonel Otway had just 150 men left. One of them was Corporal Len Daniels, aged 22, oh, whose young, job yeah. was to breach the barbed wire with a Bangalore torpedo. The Bangalore torpedo is like a piece of drain pipe. Yeah, OK. You connect the links together, slip them under the wire, and you explode them. And, uh, and it cuts the wire. It yeah. cuts, turns the wire back, and also explodes any mines that are just right. underground. Where was it you breached the wire in? Just over the centre of this concrete. Oh, right. As I can see from here. Did you have time to be frightened doing something like this? No. I can honestly say you're not frightened. But you're, you're a little bit concerned, obviously, and yeah. uh, you've got to keep going. Yeah. That's the important thing. Yeah. At half 
past four in the morning, the men of Nine Power Damn, stormed yeah. through the holes in the wire blown by the Bangalore torpedoes and charged straight through the minefield, their Sten guns blazing. In small groups, they started to knock out the German heavy guns in the casemates. I came in with the second wave and came casemate two, and the chaps were coming away from there, they'd um, sorted that one out. Yeah. So the next job was to endeavour to do our best for the wounded and get right. them out of it. After 20 minutes of chaotic hand-to-hand -hand fighting, of the 150 men who charged into the Mayorville battery, only 60 were left standing. So courageous was this attack that it's been said of Nine Power that they didn't know it was impossible, so they did it. With the Mayorville battery neutralised, the eastern flank was finally secure. It was dawn on D-Day. Out to sea, a didn't know what it was impossible. Was finally secure. It was dawn on D-Day. Out to sea, a huge fleet of some 5,000 ships and 150,000 men was poised, ready to launch the biggest invasion in all of history. This is Sword Beach. On the morning of June the 6th, 1944... Guys, I, I gotta pee quick. Be right back. I'm back. Sorry, I'll wash my hands. This is Sword Beach. On the morning of June the 6th, 1944, this was a British landing beach at the critical eastern end of the Allied invasion. A few miles over there is the Mayville Battery. Its guns have been put out of action by the men of the Parachute Regiment. Further inland is Pegasus Bridge, which has been seized by the men of the Oxen Bucks. With these pieces in place, the eastern flank is secure, and the main event, the invasion, can begin. So, a few miles out to sea, men are getting into their landing craft, ready to storm the beaches. Warships of the Royal Navy, with units of the Canadian and United States navies, range their main armour on the coastal battery. With the naval bombardment pounding over their heads, the men in the landing craft surge towards the Normandy beaches. This is an LCVP, Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel, Mark V. It's the modern equivalent of the sort of boats they used on D-Day. It holds 35 troops, it's a little bit longer and a little bit wider than the sort of boats that we used in 1944, but it's essentially exactly the same because the requirement hasn't changed, getting men onto a beach as quickly as possible. It's been described as a shoebox with a flap, and that's what it is really. The flap opens and you get your men running straight onto the beach as quickly as you possibly can. The sense of anticipation and of the fear of what's to come and the unknown closing in on you must have been, uh, must have borne down on everyone very heavily. And it's bearing down on me and all I've got to do is uh, get my feet wet, hopefully. D-Day, thousands of Allied soldiers, already seasick from the rough crossing, poured into the water from their landing craft. Hundreds of them were dropped too far out to sea and drowned almost immediately. The rest waded ashore under withering enemy fire, their heavy uniforms and boots becoming instantly waterlogged. On top of that, their progress was painfully slowed by the weight of their rifles or Bren guns, their ammunition and rations. All this before they even reached dry land. Oh, in itself, that's exhausting. Oh. And I'm not even being fired at. Oh. Eight hour on Sword Beach, the young men in the first wave of the landings faced the toughest test of their lives. In that first wave were men of the East Yorkshire Regiment, among them 19-year-old Private John Roberts. Everyone was subdued. There was no singing, there was no laughing. Everybody looked at each other, and we all had brown plastic or paper sacks. Right. And they were all even up, 
Really? Yeah. Everyone was being sick. Yeah, being sick. And uh, ended up being thrown overboard, and they were coming back over everybody. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, but it wasn't very nice, but no. there again, it couldn't be helped. And the least of your worries, actually. Yeah. Yeah. When the ramp went down, the orders were, go. How deep was the water when you came out? Up to our waist in depth. Right. And you're wading through water, yeah, yeah. waist deep, after a four or five mile trip in a yeah. thing that's been making you sick. You're hitting the beach, it's the big moment. They're firing at you. I mean, I, I, John, I, 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 to begin to get to grips with that is well, very difficult. I mean, uh, the <laughs> thing was, they could see you, but yeah. you couldn't see them. As the men of the East Yorkshires charged ashore, supported by British tanks. I, I always wondered. Um, what do you think would be more terrifying? Having to be one of the first uh, British or Canadian or, or uh, you know, uh, American people onto a fortified beach or being a German on the land and just seeing this enormous, just giant boat just armada of boats coming over the horizon and just being like crap like uh, uh, what side would be more what side would you rather be on because i feel like if you're a defender you're almost certainly gonna die right and if you're uh uh someone well if you're one of the first people getting out of the boats you're, you're a good chance of dying too but it definitely must have been terrifying for people on all sides there. They had to deal not only with the daunting German defences, but also with their own fear. Fear affects different people different ways. In my instance, I felt I knew what I had to do in my mind. Yeah. But your legs react differently. Yeah. You feel you want to run and you can't run. And then the order was, don't stop to help anybody. You can stop, help somebody else, and you can end up being killed yourself. Right. So you've got the choice. Yeah. But there again, you can't disobey order. Yeah. That tells most. Once the first wave of men and tanks had driven off the German defenders, thousands of men and machines poured onto Sword Beach all morning. At midday, the British started their push towards the key city of Caen. But at half past two, Hitler finally authorized the local German panzer divisions to counterattack. The British advance on Caen now came up against fierce resistance. Heavy fighting continued throughout the afternoon and well into the evening. By the end of D-Day, Caen was still in German hands. The cost in lives on both sides had been heavy. 156,000 Allied troops landed in Normandy on D-Day. Around 2,500 British soldiers were either killed or wounded. American and Canadian casualties were some 7,500. Total Allied losses of 10,000 were terrible, but not nearly as bad as Eisenhower and Montgomery had been expecting. They'd been predicting something nearer 40,000. Yes. Little consolation for the families who lost their sons that day. D-Day was drawing to a close. The heroic British missions in the Eastern Sector had contributed to the extraordinary success of Operation Overlord. But the Allies had not achieved all of their objectives. Midnight at the end of D-Day. This is the situation. The Americans have taken Utah and Omaha beaches. Their airborne soldiers have dropped in behind enemy lines to secure the exits from the beach. The Canadians have taken Juneau Beach and are pushing inland. The British are doing the same at Gold Beach. Over here on the critical eastern flank, the British have taken Sword Beach and joined up with the men who seized Pegasus Bridge and the Merville Battery the night before. Apart from at Omaha Beach, Resistance has been light. The Germans have been taken completely by surprise. The deception plan has worked. But the Allies have failed in one of their main objectives, capturing the key city of Caen. Whoever controls this city controls this part of France. With the beachhead secure, the battle for Normandy can begin.
this next episode. Okay. Really interesting. Uh, I love World War II documentaries in general, but this one has Al Murray in it, so even better. Uh, yeah. Um, really interesting. Hope you guys learned something or can uh, teach me something or hope you enjoyed watching that with me. And uh, I, I think I'm going to just continue the episode. So hope you're doing well. Appreciate you for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye, guys.